It was 4,000 feet up in the mountains. It was 25,000 of us went up. We was there approximately three weeks, and we lost 3,000 men in three weeks. 35 to 40 below zero. Two feet of snow. Couldn't eat, you couldn't sleep. You uh, couldn't shower, shave, didn't have no change of clothes or nothing. You had two pair of socks. When you change your socks, the dirty ones, you put them down inside your clothes to dry them out. <laughs> we had those rubber shoe, rubber boots. So when you walked, your feet sweat. And then when you stopped, they froze. And that's, what, that's how you got frostbite so bad. They, they'd come up the mountain every night, three, four, five hundred at a time. And they just keep coming, you mow them right down, the next one to pick up their rifles and just keep coming. You couldn't dig a hole, because was, everything was frozen 35, 40 below zero. They had to leave the trucks running all the time so they wouldn't freeze up. Half the time your rifle wouldn't fire, the weapons wouldn't fire, it was so cold. Corman had the, the syringes, they had to carry the syringes in their mouth so they wouldn't uh, freeze up on them. If you had food, you was lucky they let you try to thaw it out so you could eat it, you know. And somebody said, well, you had a nice Thanksgiving dinner. I said, yeah, you go over and get it. Then you go up, it was nice and hot. And then you go over and sit down two minutes later and it's frozen, mm -hmm. trying to eat <laughs> Like charring on a bone, you know. We, uh, we had all good, uh, real good officers. They were all uh, World War II veterans. They knew their business, in fact, they, some, one of the reporters uh, interviewed one of them one time, and he said, well, I was, World War II, I was down on the Pacific. He said, we had malaria, swamps, rain, mosquitoes. But he said, it was nothing like this place up here in Chosen Reservoir. He said, you never see anything like that before. Like they said in the book, you're fighting two wars, the Chinese and the cold weather. It was, it was really, it was really tough going. <clears throat> and, uh, Oh, there's all kinds of stories. I'm Jim Hughes. I was born and raised in Portland. When I got out of career, I went to work for the city of Portland as a dispatcher for the fire department. 20 years, retired at 1977 when I was 48 years old. And we have uh, four children, three girls and one boy. Five grandchildren, seven great grandchildren. <laughs> Now we got a big family. I'm not your six foot four, 225 pound Marine. I'm just a little guy. <laughs> but a guy said to me one time, you was in the Marines? Hey, you're, you're kind of small, aren't you? I said, hey, I went in, I done my job. Don't make any difference with how big you are or how small you are. If you can do the job, you, you got the, you're a Marine. And I mean, I was in good shape because as a kid, before I went into the service, I was always walking. I walked five miles sometimes. I do a lot of not running, you know, just running. I figured I was in good shape when I went in. When I went in, I weighed 132 pounds. When I left to go to Korea, I weighed 155. And when I come back from Korea, I weighed 132. <laughs> so I lost 23 pounds up there, yep. I was a member of the anti-tank assault platoon. Uh, 2nd Battalion, 7th Regiment, 7th Marine Division, uh, 7th Regiment, 1st Marine Division. <clears throat> Colonel Litzenberg was my commander in Korea, and he was known as Blitz and Litz and the 7th Ridge Runners. And I always say anybody that run more ridges than we did, well, they got to be a hell of a lot older than I am. <laughs> <clears throat> what did they tell you your mission was as you headed north? Well, they really didn't tell us nothing. And we knew we was going up to the Chosen Reservoir, but they didn't, didn't tell us much, you know. We just had to, had to guess on what was going on, I guess, but you could tell. When they got there, they had red, blue, and white, they called them, uh, beaches. Red, beach, white, beach, and each one was a sound to us, I signed to it. Well, the one we happened to hit had a 15-foot stone wall there, so we had, <laughs> had to climb that thing. <laughs> <laughs> but that really wasn't uh, bad when we got in there until we got to Seoul. There wasn't much ex resistance until we got into Seoul. Took over there. The North Koreans didn't took it over again, so we had to go in the second time and take it. 
And then as we done that way, that's when we, uh, they just, MacArthur decided to go to, up to the, uh, up north to the uh, Chosen Reservoir, which we wasn't supposed to go, but we did anyway, so. Ninety percent of the people, uh, the troops over there were Marines, but we was under the Army, so they said they, everything was ill. The Army was in charge of everything, and of course, I can't say much about the Army, but Marines and Army, MacArthur and Smith did not get along. You know? <clears throat> They had a lot of arguments with him and MacArthur, because MacArthur said, we're going right up there, because that's why he got fired. Truman fired him, because he went, but he wasn't supposed to go up to the Chosen Reservoir. <clears throat> so he wanted to bust right up there and go right into China and all, oh, take care of everything, you know, we'll be home by Christmas. Well, <clears throat> O.P. Smith says, no, we move up and then bring our supplies. We move up and then bring our supplies. And that, that works out, that worked out good, <clears throat> yeah. When we first got over there, we was moving up one time, and we were getting mortar fire, and we didn't know how they was getting the information. Well, we got and there was a bridge there, so they looked under the bridge, and there were two guys and a woman, and they was giving it, telling them we was moving up, and, you know, giving them all the information. The South Koreans would uh, capture some North Koreans. They'd, Take them back to get them interrogated. Oh yeah, they go around the corner, <clears throat> right into this. That's it. No interrogation. Kill them. They just shoot them. Oh yeah, they didn't care who you was. They, it was it was terrible, terrible. I could tell you a story about the two, three army guys prisoners. <clears throat> These are all facts. This has been documented. <clears throat> three army guys were uh, taken prisoner by the Chinese, <clears throat> and because they didn't care whether you starved to death and they wouldn't give you any medication or nothing. So one of them was shot in the leg <clears throat> and uh, his two buddies finally decided, well, you got gangrene in there, this has got to come off. So he said, well, what are we going to take it off with? Oh, well, I don't know, we got to find something. So he happened to have a knife, so he gave him a knife. They took his leg out, no medication, you know, nothing. You couldn't bleed to death up there because <laughs> everything froze up. So they took his leg off, <clears throat> and years later, this uh, reporter got a hold of the story. So he says, I'm gonna look this guy up. Well, he went and looked him up. He found him down south. He was 75 years old. He had a prosthetic leg. So the reporter says, uh, well, there was a knife involved. What about the knife? He reached in his pocket and pulled out a pocket knife. He says, that's it right there. So that's, that's what we went through over there, yeah. Everything over there had a code name. The code name of the martyrs was uh, Candy, Hershey Candy, the little round things. Tootsie Rolls? Tootsie Rolls. So one day the guy down on the line called up and he said, we need, to, we need some Tootsie Rolls, and they give him all the information. Well, they're supposed to get modest. We got Tootsie Rolls. They dropped a whole load of Tootsie Rolls. So I guess there was probably a little to say about that. But somebody got the wrong, didn't get the message, you know. We ate Tootsie Rolls for a week. <laughs> we had all kinds of Tootsie Rolls. I was a bazooka man. I was in charge of, I had a bazooka. Bazooka. I had uh, me and my assistant and the ammo man. There was three of us. So uh, I let the other guy fire. <laughs> but actually, we didn't. We didn't. Didn't see any tanks, so we didn't have to do any shooting. We was on the. We was on the blockade, and when we left the chosen reservoir, first of all, the doctor, the, the corpsman comes around and checks you. So he said checking your feet. So he says to me, he said, let me see your feet. So I said, all right. So I took my boots and my shoes off. Well, he said, those are look like a rainbow, black, yellow, red, you know. I said, really? He said, yeah, you got a bad case of frostbite. They didn't call it frostbite, they call it an immersion foot. Now it's, now it's frostbite. <clears throat> and uh, so he said, I'd like to send you back to Japan, to the hospital, but he said, we got so many casualties coming in. He says, you'll have to walk. Okay, I can walk. 
Well, they jump on the tank to get a ride. That exhaust from the tank was worse than walking. It was so cold. And then when they pulled up and somebody says, fire up, I said, uh-oh, boom, almost knocked me off the tank. I said, nah, I think I'll get off and walk. So we got up and we started walking. And every time we come to a, <clears throat> a shack, we set it a fire so we could keep warm. You know, because they was all, they was all abandoned anyway. <clears throat> Before we left <clears throat> the reservoir to head down south, <clears throat> They had, a, of course, had a convoy. They had the uh, dead and wounded lo loaded into the trucks. The Chinese attacked us. They didn't care. Whether they were dead or alive in the truck, they just shot everybody in the truck. The first thing they went after, the first guy they went after was the driver of the truck. And then, and then they set the truck on fire. So it was, it, was a, it was really a mess. We got down the reservoir a ways, and they had a big uh, hydroelectric building there, you know. And there was a <clears throat> bridge right there. And this, this was the only way out. If you didn't get across that bridge, you wouldn't make it out. The Chinese blew the bridge. So they said, well, we gotta make plans for that. So he asked Shepard again, can you build a bridge? Well, of course I can. <laughs> General, he said, I've done it before. I've done everything you wanted me to. He says, I can do it. So the first time it was ever done, they called the Air Force. And they uh, had a dry run the first time. The second time, they dropped steel beams, weighed 2,500 pounds a piece, dropped four of them. We only needed three. We lost one, good thing we still had three. And then they dropped all the uh, boards there to cover it up. They uh, built the bridge, but right there at the bridge, you look down, a thousand foot drop. So. <laughs> If you made a slip like you was gone, hello. <laughs> but we made it out of there. We uh, had we had plenty of uh, to say good things about the Air Force because it hadn't been for them, we'd have never made it out of there. Uh, chosen few have a star for their logo, and. They call it, we called it the Star of Coterie because we was up in Coterie and it was snowing. And we was waiting for the stars to come out so we could have the Air Force come in and give us some help. We couldn't do anything because it was snowing so bad. So when the star come out, two of the officers, big shots, were in their tent. They said, what's that noise? And then they found out it was the Marines singing the Marine Corps hymn, and the, the star would come out. So that's why they called it the Star of Coterie, and that's our logo on my head out there. They sent a company up uh, on one of the mountains to uh, open, keep the pass open for us. <clears throat> it was Dog Company of the 7th Regiment, the outfit that I was in. And they, they really went through what you call hell. They was up there. And the Chinese attack them every single night. Well, they went up with the full company, and by the time the fight was over, there was about 10 or 12 guys that could walk out. All the rest of them were either killed or wounded. And <clears throat> they uh, sent somebody in to help them out, and they went, geez, I don't know, two or three nights in a row, all day long and all day night to get there to help them. And they got a book, and the name of the book is The Last Stand of Fox Company. And that's one of the true stories of the reservoir. <clears throat> Another one is the survivor, the story of uh, General O.P. Smith, Oliver P. Smith. In the book, The Survivor, it says how he got 10,000 Marines out of the reservoir. So that was less, what was left that could walk out of there out of the 25,000. So. And I happened to be one of them. Well, I didn't walk, I limped and rode and <laughs> yeah. We got out, out of the reservoir and on the down by the ocean there, getting ready to go aboard the ship. The colonel says, All right, we're gonna march out like Marines. So we're marching down the road, singing the Marine Corps hymn, you know. Beers, dirty, stinky, everything. And uh, two of the guys, two of the Officers in the crowd watching us says, I'm, I'm going to say it whether you want to eliminate it or not. He says, Look at those magnificent bastards. And that's what he called us. 
So we got a board ship down there to go to Pusan. Some went to Pusan and some went some. I went to Pusan, but you got a board ship there. Nice clean clothes, shower, shave. Oh, that was wonderful. Oh, we give you a good meal. But everybody got sick. Couldn't stand it. Couldn't stand a good meal after eating all those sea rations, you know, like that. Yeah. When we get in evacuated there at Hung Nam, like they, they blew the uh, everything up that was left over. Anything that couldn't be taken or used, they blew it up. And it was quite a quite a sight. You talk about Fourth of July. Uh, you never saw a Fourth of July like that before. <laughs> I'm a lifetime member of the DAV, and I belong to the. Uh, well, retired volunteer fire department in association in Portland. Yeah, and the chosen few naturally. Mm -hmm. I belong to the. They have two of them. They have the national, and then every chapter has their own chapter. Every state has their own chapter. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of the big states like Texas and California had two or three of them. But because of age, they're kind of dwindling, you know, mm -hmm. and <laughs> getting down. That's the same way with our lunch. We used to have. Oh, 15, 20 guys sometimes go to our luncheon in Portland here. Lucky we get 10 now. Because <laughs> we take our wives with us. We used to get 10 or 11 wives, but you know, well, they're crippled up. They're in a home and all that stuff, you know. So I said, Ah, oh, Jim, you're still being a pain in the butt, but you're still around anyway. <laughs> those, those poor people can't make it, so. <clears throat> but every time I go out, my wife says, Make sure you got your cane with you. I said, Okay. My wife and I went on vacation in 91. <clears throat> Didn't know where he was going, we just took off in the truck with a camper on it. We ended up in Tennessee. And on the way, met a guy coming right up behind me in his car, blowing his horn. I said, go ahead, you want to go? He chased us into McDonald's. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I had to talk to you. He said, my, my next door neighbors got the same stickers that you got on your car, Chosen Reservoir. I said, really? Yeah. We went to Tennessee, checked in at the motel. I said to my wife, I said, you go down, open up, and I'll be down in a minute when I pay. So I paid him and uh, went down, went out the door. She was talking with some guy. I said, now I know she doesn't know anybody in Tennessee. So I went down and introduced myself. He says, I don't know you, but he says, I recognized your truck and you and your wife coming out of the hotel, out of the restaurant when, we, when I was going in. So we had a little conversation then. Had a couple chase us into the uh, pharmacy right down here, community pharmacy one day. Oh, it was just three or four years ago. We was, we was just coming home from our luncheon in Portland. She used to come up and rapping on the window of the truck, you know. I rolled down, I said, can I help you? Oh yeah, I see you was in the Marines and blah, blah, blah. She wanted to talk, so she said, my mother and father were both in the Marines. My father was in Korea at the Chosen Reservoir. My mother has the same license plates as you have on your truck, the fuel. So she had to take some pictures and have a little conversation. I said, geez, that's great. <laughs> you got any message for the young ones? Yeah, if you want a good job, join the military. They have a pension. <laughs>